kids leading worship and not just showing us how cute they are. They will be leading worship. We're training up the next generation of, of young disciples and of church leaders. I hope you'll keep that in mind as you worship along with us this morning. I want to say a special hello to those of you who are worshiping with us online. Likewise, we are so pleased and honored by you tuning in. And whether you're watching this on a Sunday or a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday, I want you to remember that God is with you wherever you are. And I pray that as you watch and as you listen, as you participate in and uh, maybe sense the spirit that is in this place, that it will be with you as well. Um, a little later on in the service, uh, we will be in encouraging you to... Um, Fill out a card to let us know you are here. Um, look, we're not into twisting arms. I know that many of you this morning are here to see young ones sing. If you have a church home that you call your own, God bless you. Get involved there. Plug in. But if you haven't yet found a church home, we'd love to have the opportunity to tell you about what we do here. What it is we believe that we're both evangelical in the sense of wanting to share the good news of Christ but radically inclusive of all people. We are Methodists, and we use our minds in doing theology. We appreciate rational thought. We'd love to tell you about what it is we believe and what it is we believe God has called us to be in this community. But the main thing is, thanks for being here. And now, as we prepare to worship, I invite your attention not only to this moment, but to the promised presence of God who is with us this morning. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Today we are celebrating a special Sunday that has become known as Children's Sabbath. The observation was started by the Children's Defense Fund, a group working to bring justice and hope for all children all over the world. It is a day to make congregations of many faith beliefs aware of the needs of children and call God's adult children to act on behalf of God's younger children. Thank you, Henley. Good morning, church. Our opening hymn this morning is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. You'll find the words printed in your bulletin. Let's stand and sing together.
Come, let us worship our God who creates each one of us in his image. We are all God's children. May we welcome all children as Christ welcomed them into his presence. Everyone is a child of God. Empower us to make a difference for all children. We are all children of a mighty God. Inspire faith to take action so we may raise up the next generation with hope and love for the future. Together. Please be seated. Please be seated. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for my life and the lives of those who love me. I pray for kids who do not have caring families and loving friends. Thank, thank you, thank you for my home. I pray for children who have no home or or safe place to stay. Thank you for clean water and healthy food. I pray for kids who do not have enough food to eat and clean water to drink. Thank you for my school and the opportunity to learn. I pray for children who cannot go to school and have no hopes or dreams about what they will be when they grow up. Thank you for my church and the blessing of discovering who I am in the kingdom of God. I pray for kids who have no church family and do not know they are precious children of God. Will you join me in the congregation response? Thank you for all the children in this congregation. They may be cherished and protected with our fellowship. They you, Thank you when they talk and, and make noises in the leadership. Thank you when they squirm and wiggle in the pews. Thank you when they run through the halls with bright eyes and wide smiles. Thank you for their honest prayers and the joyful presence in our midst. Churches, we pray for children who do not have a church family, and we pray for churches with no children, for they are churches with no future. And let us pray, pray the prayer Jesus taught us all to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen.
The children of this church want to say thank you to the grown-ups for giving the children's ministry so we can have midweek, vacation Bible school, Bible camp, and all the special activities for kids. And thank you for all the adults who volunteer to be with us. And especially we are thankful for Miss Felicia and Miss Marisha. All of you are investing in the future of the church by helping us learn to be disciples of Jesus. Now let's share with our hearts as we give our tithes and offerings. Ushers, please come forward. Let's pray. Let us pray. Lord of all, we are the receivers of love, grace, and Jesus. We are the givers following Jesus. We give these offerings for the work of our kingdom. With humble thanks for all the blessings we have received. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Our hymnody of preparation, dear Lord, lead me day by day, might not be familiar to you. It is a folk song from the Philippines set to the Christian's text to the worship king will help you learn it. We'll sing the first verse phrase by phrase and you'll sing each one after us. By the second and third verse, you'll know and it, and we'll sing it together. Here is number 11, 411. Dear Lord, lead me day by day. Got that? So they will sing a phrase, you will sing the same phrase. All right, let's go. Bible reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 13 through 14, and 24 through the 27th. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy. That leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard, that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that, that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came, fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell. A great fall, a great was its fall. May God bless the reading, hearing, and receiving of these words. 
Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you so much to our Flame Arts Worship Leadership Group. Thank you so much. You guys have done great. So proud of each one of you. Some of you may be wondering where the earlier uh, choir and our fun day school kids went. They got another gig. Um, they, uh, they have gone from this place down the hall to our modern worship service so that worshipers in that setting, that service begins at 1115 each Sunday morning. It's got a contemporary kind of electric feel, but we wanted to make sure that those who were worshipers in that setting got to hear the kids as well. So um, after that, they'll be somewhere. You can find them later. We'll, we'll have them somewhere for you to pick them up, okay? Um, I hope that you received a printed order of worship this morning. You're going to need it. Especially the insert that is a part of that packet of papers. Here's what I've been hoping, praying, working on, and suspecting over the last few days. That by the end of this sermon, this sheet of paper may be so important to you that you'll not throw it away, but take it home with you. I think some of the things that I'm going to illustrate to you draw your attention to, speak about and describe this morning, may convey a message from God. I know that sounds maybe a little bit arrogant. It's not my doing. I'm simply wanting you to know that I think we're going to hear some things this morning that are very important, and I hope you'll give it your best attention. You know, for thousands of years, human beings have understood that annual celebrations are important. Um, some are, were related to the seasons of harvest. There are others that were associated with specific dates. For example, our nation's celebration of its independence. It happens on a specific date every year, July 4th. We're going to celebrate Independence Day. In just a couple of weeks in the church or in mainline Protestant churches and in Roman Catholic churches as well, we'll talk about All Saints Day. All Saints Day happens every year on November 1st. And that's the origins also of All Hallows Eve, the evening before All Saints Day, which we call Halloween. There are other annual celebrations that are not tied to a specific date, but they are held annually. This is what's called a movable feast. Now, the reason it's called a movable feast is because in the early days of the church especially, um, these were feast days, Easter, Pentecost, um, and Jewish feasts as well. And they weren't tied to a specific date, but rather to a time of year. So, for instance, each and every year in all Christian churches, we have the celebration of Easter. But it's not tied to a specific date. It's going to be on a Sunday, but the date changes from year to year. It moves around. It's a movable feast. Likewise, our celebration of Pentecost. It's going to happen on a Sunday. But the date changes from year to year. Now, the idea behind all of these, whether they are national celebrations or religious celebrations, is this. These are so important, we're going to have them every year. Every year, we're going to remember this date, this occurrence, this circumstance, because we dare not go more than a year without remembering these things. This is a very important idea. It's something that 
human beings have understood. We've got to talk about some of these things, lest we forget them. Now, today we come to an annual occasion in this church. It doesn't happen in other churches. Other churches have children's Sabbath. But this morning, I'll be preaching my annual sermon on trajectory. Now, first of all, I want you to know this is not the same sermon that I've preached in previous years. I always change it a little bit. But I believe that we must talk about the concept of trajectory at least once a year. I'm convinced that what I'm going to share with you today is of such import that we dare not let it slip. Now, I don't mean to assert that my annual tradition, and this has been going on for about 10 years now, I hope it doesn't sound too arrogant, friends. I'm just leveling with you. I think I've come across a concept. I'm convinced, I'm going to show you some pictures and diagrams that can change the way we look at things, that can really impact us as parents and grandparents, as members of the church, and as disciples of our Lord. I always preach, <coughs> I always preach my trajectory sermon on children's Sabbath because it is so closely tied to the sacred responsibility to raise up children in the way they should go. What I'm going to share with you this morning and point to in these charts and graphs is directly tied to our calling to raise up the next generation of faithful disciples. I think it is essential that we talk about this because, well, for instance, if I was to ask you the question, could a church get by without talking about these things? The answer is, oh yeah, but take a look at the church. Would it be okay if a congregation didn't talk about raising up the next generation of disciples? Or even, uh, would it be okay if a church went for several years without having a children's Sabbath? The answer is, oh yeah, and some do. But take a look at those churches. What we find is that in some congregations, there comes a tipping point. They neglected to talk about children and youth. They neglected to remind themselves of the concepts around trajectory that I'm going to share with you today. And over time, they reached a tipping point when they looked around and found out there's nothing, there's no one in the sanctuary but old people. They're not bad people. And they didn't mean for it to happen. It's just that they neglected to address these important topics. Now, trajectory is a word that you will not find in the scriptures. Best we can tell, it first appear, appears um, about 325 years ago. But I submit to you that the concept of trajectory is throughout the scriptures. For example, train up a child in the way that he or she should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Friends, that's trajectory. Aim a kid in the right direction and keep them on the right pathway, and when they are old, take note of where they end up. Jesus spoke about trajectory in very encouraging ways. Read the Gospels, and you find out that Jesus began his public ministry by going down to the River Jordan. He was baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist, and then it says, from that time forward, Jesus began to preach. Now, the sermon was very short. Just a few words long. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did you know that's trajectory? Repent isn't a word that means cry and feel sorry. Repent is a word that has to do with aim and direction. 
Jesus was saying, turn around, face a new direction. The kingdom of God is right here. Can you turn around and see it? I'm headed in this direction. Follow me and become a part of the kingdom. For some people, they had to do a 180, all right? Sometimes that's what it takes, a 180-degree turn because they've been headed away from God. For other people, they've kind of been heading in a decent direction, but Jesus invites us to fine-tune our trajectory. That was his message to his earliest hearers. They were Jews. They knew of the one God. They had read the scriptures, but he was saying, okay, but now shift your focus. Aim in the direction I'm going to lead you. Trajectory is such a hopeful concept, and I hope to make that plain in just a little while. Let us remember that if a person is willing to start on a new course, there's no telling what might happen. Hey, I preached for a while. We got to get out of here and get to lunch eventually. So if you take your, this piece of paper in your hand, I'd like to guide you through this series of diagrams. On the first page, um, in the chart that is labeled general learning, this is an illustration about how life is. Now, friends, this is almost inarguable. I could give you the research, but you know this is true. Along the bottom is a timeline that represents a person's life. Starts on the left at age zero, where we all begin. Ends over there about 80. Now, people live to be longer than 80. But the average lifespan in the United States right now is about 78 years. Although that's likely to come down a little bit in future months because of early deaths to COVID. But let's just go ahead and say average life expectancy in these United States, about zero to 80. If you get more, wonderful, thank God. The blue line represents the way most lives are lived. It's amazing in those early years. Psychologists, um, physicians um, will tell us you cannot imagine how steep this learning curve is in the earliest years of life. See how sharply that blue line heads upward? Before they are even in school, kids learn how to speak, how to enunciate, how to interact with others, how to play, how to walk, how to coordinate their limbs. It is amazing. And then they get into school and learn even more things. Their, their worldview is, is expanded exponentially as they begin to talk about names, that they, names of people they will never meet in places they will never be. They learn history and social studies and mathematics and trigonomics and all these sorts of things. It is amazing. But then what happens in most people's lives is that when they no longer have to learn, they sort of stop learning. It's just the truth. That's why that blue line begins to taper off. Oh, yes, people learn new life skills, and they travel a little bit and learn about new places. They continue, perhaps, in their job to learn some new ways of doing things. But generally speaking, by the time most people are 40 or 50 years of age, they're kind of set. They know which news station they watch. They know which political party they are. They know what religion or church they belong. They know what they believe about the Bible. Now, this is just typical, all right? I don't mean to, um, I don't make in. I, I don't want to make anybody feel guilty for being normal, all right? But I will point out that Jesus had some pretty direct things to say to those who weren't willing to learn new things. That's a topic for a different sermon. But it seems to me that in the teachings of Jesus, we are encouraged to live a life that's a little bit more like the orange line. Let me direct your attention there. 
like the blue line person, there's a sharp and steep upward trajectory. As they learn all these amazing, amazing things, not just gross motor skills, but fine motor skills. They learn how to sing. They learn how to do all these amazing things, how to play t-ball, and then they go to school. So these lines are really close to one another, uh, at least through high school, because guess what? They're in the same classes. They're learning the same thing. But about the time that they get out of high school, or perhaps for some, when they get out of college and start their careers, you'll see that there is a difference. The orange line continues upward. Now, I want to point out that this does not necessarily have anything to do with whether one chooses um, higher education or not. It doesn't have to do with whether you go to college or not. It has to do with trajectory. It has to do with the aim of a person's life. Some of the most well-rounded, impressive, most knowledgeable people I have ever known are not folks that had multiple college degrees. What, was a, what set them apart was that they just continued to learn. They asked questions. They weren't afraid to admit what they didn't know. They asked and found out. They tried new habits. Now, as you look at the, those two lines, what you'll see is that by the time, because of the different aim, because of their different trajectory, when they get to be about 20 or 30, there's a little bit of gap in those lives, all right? Uh, go to 40 and 50, and the gap increases. Go to 60 and 70, and the gap is even greater. And these people find themselves in very different circumstances. What are the circumstances? That brings me to the second chart. The second chart is a range of four what we're calling ways of living. I don't mean, mean to be judgmental. I don't mean to be harsh. I hope that we are always compassionate with those who were given a different, uh, who were dealt a different hand than those of us who were quite fortunate. But let's tell the truth. The green range, a lower range, would represent the lives of people that are born into situations such as uh, criminality, disregard for the law, physical abuse, sexual abuse, addiction. Hey, there are some ways of living that are just not very good. That's just the truth. Above that, in the yellow range, we would call these maybe people who struggle. And by the way, the word struggle there is good because struggle means that they're trying. They might not have been given as many opportunities. They might have some mental or physical illness in their families. They might be poverty stricken. But these are people that are trying to do the right thing. A little higher up in the orange level, we would call these people with a moral compass. They may be Christian, they may not, they may be church people, they may not, but they live a better life because of the direction in which they have aimed themselves toward values, certain values. These are households where there are things like kindness and forgiveness, where intelligence is valued, where uh, friendship and community is valued. And then in the very top, uh, the purple range, we would call this the range where these people have kind of gotten it together, spiritually speaking. I, I say spiritually because they may have money and they may not. And they may have advanced degrees and they may not. Uh, they may be prominent in their community, but they may not. But their lives have thing li things like honesty, integrity, love, forgiveness, um, a sense of purpose. They've learned the value of giving to others, sharing with the community, having an eternal perspective. It's a good way to live. If you'll turn the sheet over and look to the next, um, to the next chart, we've called this moral, de moral development and behavior. Now, this is an interesting chart because I'm just telling you that there are some households and lives and ways of living that are not very moral. They're, they're, they're just not very moral. And they don't care very much about that. It's just getting by. Steal if you have to. Hit if you have to. You know? Take if you have to. 
Now, I want to draw attention to four lines here. I can go through them fairly, fairly briefly. Now, let's take a look at the orange one. The orange one is a good line. This is what you want to happen. And it's important to note that nobody gets from, uh, from green to purple overnight. Nobody gets from green to purple overnight. It takes time. But given time, just pointed in the right direction, somebody gets to a very good place. If you look at the blue line, the flatness of this is, is accentuated even more in this because that's the way some people's lives are. Now, here's what we know. Um, unless there are external forces uh, that come to bear on a person's life, most people end up sort of like their parents. They really do. Uh, because of inflation and some things like that, they might make a little more money. They might be a little bit, uh, they might share some different uh, uh, opinions. But generally speaking, we kind of end up like our parents, unless something happens to us. And there are good things and bad things that can happen to us. Take a look, if you will, at the yellow line. Now, the yellow line is intriguing. The yellow line starts low. The yellow line starts in a bad range and stays that way for a good long while, but something happens, and their trajectory changed. They didn't have as many years to get as high, maybe, as the orange person did, but look, look at that, look at that direction of their lives. Have you seen this? I have seen this. This is beautiful when it happens. Someone comes, this is my first time in church. How old are you? 60 years old. I just, I just felt like something was missing from my life. Someone comes along and says, you know what? I've been an alcoholic for 50 years. I've gone through three wives and my kids won't speak to me. I got to do something. I think I'll go to one of those AA meetings. I've reached my absolute bottom. And you know what happens? Things begin to change. It's amazing. There's another line on the chart that needs to be noted, the gray line. Begins at a good place. You see it in the next. Uh, it, you, could, you could take a look at moral development and behavior or even the comparisons kind okay, chart. And you see that some folks uh, are dealt a pretty good hand, um, raised up in a good family, taught some good things. And then something happens. Have you ever seen that happen? I've seen that happen. Now, um, I'm going to die one of these days. So I'm going to tell you everything I know. I'm not going to hold back. All right. You can judge me if you'd like. I can tell you I've got the research to back it up. Let me tell you what I've seen. When this downward, when this downward trend starts, whether it starts when they're 18 or 25 or 35 or 45, it often has to do with money or tragic circumstances or sex. Some dalliance some loss of discipline. So I, I, I'd, add, uh, I'd add substance abuse in there as well. Um, chances are you've seen somebody that was doing fine until they became the big, you know, frat house party boy or girl on campus. And next thing you know, they weren't doing so well. Um, so there's substance abuse and there's sex and, and there's some tragic circumstances. So. That can happen too. Now, um, I want to bring the sermon to a, a, a close here. So I want you, to, if you don't have a pen or pencil, I want you to reach ahead of you into the back of the pew. I know we've got pens and pencils there. I want you to take the pen, pen or pencil. And on, and on one of those uh, charts on the back, any one of them, I'd like you to draw an oval around uh, the age group that you would call adolescence. Let me tell you what adolescence is. Um, at, we do know, actually, that adolescence is happening earlier than it ever has. Some of it has to do with, I mean, physically, hormonally. People are, uh, uh, young men and women are entering adolescence physically earlier. But it's also earlier in terms of what they're exposed to, the decisions that they have to make what they've seen, you know, the psychological stuff. But choose about a 10-year period in there, and I want you to draw an oval around it, OK? 
okay? Could be 12 to 22, could be 13 to 23, 15 to 25. That's okay, just circle that, all right? Or, or draw an oval around that, and let me tell you why it's so important that we do that. It is during these brief, brief, sometimes very difficult, but brief, 10 years, that life-altering and life-determining decisions are made. If you doubt it, just think about your own teenage years. Most of us had more going on than our parents knew about. Most of us were exposed to more things than our parents suspected. During these years, the kid makes the decision. I drink alcohol or I don't. I get wasted or I don't. I'll try illegal drugs or I won't. I believe in God or I don't. I drive crazy or I won't. I'm going on to higher education. I'm not. I'm sexually active. I'm not. I think it would be okay to have a baby out of wedlock as a teenager. I don't think that would be a good idea. These amazingly, amazingly crucial decisions. All right? What does it mean for us? For moms and dads, I hope we realize if there's a time to set an example, it's early on. I know parents that have gone to the dinner table and thought, we should at least pray before meals, but I don't know how to pray. My kids will notice that we haven't been doing it and now we're doing it. I feel silly. I get this feeling that I ought to talk to my kids about God, but I don't know much about God. Maybe I ought to tell them a bedtime story, but they're going to think I'm ridiculous. Really? You're going to let that get in the way? Realizing the import of being a good parent that sets kids on a proper trajectory. I was thinking this week, I, I was in conversation with one of my Jewish friends, and just realize, you know what? For centuries, for centuries, people have hated the Jews and tried to wipe them off the planet. Literally. There have been open programs of, let's get rid of the Jews. And yet they exist. Why? They have taken seriously the words of Deuteronomy that say, teach your children. While you're walking along the road, while you're driving along in the car, make sure they understand and hear the story. So they're still here. Second, for those of us who are church people, I'm one of them, you're one of them, friends, we got to invest in this age group. All right? Hey, you can put me in an old Sunday school class with faded paint and chipped paint and a, and a, and a ragged carpet. I'll still come. Because I can look past that. You know, I understand the economics of the church. But it's not right to do that to kids who are so easily impacted by what is visual. They can tell that you care. They can tell. Have you invested? Are you volunteering in the spiritual life of your kids? Are you, if you go to another church, have you plugged in? Do you at least know what's going on? Do you encourage your kids to go? All right. We allowed, Georgia and I, allowed our kids to skip church if they wanted to. But it also meant they weren't going anywhere else that week. They quickly decided, oh, I'll trade that one or two hours. It was a rule because it was important. We who are the church must value youth and children's ministry. It, it really is more important than ministry to adults. Why? Not because you don't matter. Because you're already set. You already had your chance. All right? We'll work with you. We love you. And yes, there are some who come in late. But look at the charts. 
This is the group we've got the most chance with. And not only that, but what happens? Are you watching me? This is a visual. What happens when you take a 10-year-old and you aim them just a little bit up? If you just move that kid from green to yellow, if you just move them from yellow to orange, you don't have to do it overnight, but you aim them in the right direction. Do you know what happens over 10 years and 20 years and 30 years and 40 years? That's the hope. Last thing I want to say this morning about trajectory is don't forget the good news is for you and me too. So you've messed up. So you've blown it. So you haven't been what you should have. That offer, the offer to change trajectory is always there. And God will be your helper. And Jesus will be your teacher. And the Spirit will give you the energy to do it. And the community of faith will encourage you along the way. So... Thank God for kids. Thank God for adults who care about kids. Thank God that we can see in a visual way how important this is so that we are motivated to raise up the next generation of disciples for their sake, for the world's sake, for God's sake. Amen. Let's pray together. Forgive us for letting down. Forgive us, oh God, for putting it on somebody else, for hoping that our kids might pick it up. Remind us, oh God, that above all else, it is what we teach and tell of you, of the good news of how it might be if we are rightly related to you. Learn how to live the way that you have instructed. Give us what we need, oh God, so that we invest ourselves fully in this holy and sacred task. For we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Soli. Thanks to the children who added so much to our worship service this morning. Weren't they great? And I want to say many, many thanks to all the parents, the grandparents, the guardians, the family, friends who work so hard to get him here. Whether it's a Sunday morning, a Sunday afternoon rehearsal, a Wednesday night activity, a Thursday morning chapel service. Hey, did you know Funday School does a Thursday morning chapel service? That's pretty cool, huh? You're showing them that it's important to be here, to build that relationship, to learn about God in Jesus. Thank you very much. All right, let's sing our hymn of invitation, This Little Light of Mine. Let's stand as we sing. As we leave this place, what is our mission? To make the disciples of Jesus Christ the transformation, transformation of the world. world. Well, as we come to a close today, I hope that your heart is as full as mine is with just all these wonderful children and this beautiful worship service. 
In our upcoming week, you may want to look at the bulletin or check into our Facebook page to check out what's happening around. I do want to mention uh, one thing that we're so pleased this week to be hosting the Ellis County African American Hall of Fame banquet. That's going to be this week. And upcoming, we have some special Halloween activities for our kids that Wednesday before Halloween. So I hope that you'll check that out. We've got a great pumpkin party, and I believe the youth have costume skating. How fun is that? So if you're looking for stuff for your children, please come and be a part of us. Receive the benediction. We are all children of a mighty God. Go and shine your lights as God's re redeemed child, always growing in Christ. Amen. 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 